In acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, let us also acknowledge some truths. Aboriginal people, as we know, have a special connection to their country. That makes the impacts of climate change a particularly important issue for our First Nations people. We must also acknowledge that climate change can and will worsen existing inequalities. Think of the impact of increased natural disasters, flood and cyclone in remote communities where housing is already poor, where isolation may be increased even further. Think also of the acute impact of rising sea levels on our Torres Strait Island brothers and sisters, who are already seeing sites of cultural significance literally washed away before their eyes. So in, in acknowledging the stewardship of our First Nations people over our lands and waters for millennia, let us also acknowledge the impact of climate change is another one of the many issues for which First Nations people deserve a constitutionally enshrined voice to the Australian Parliament. I also want to acknowledge some special guests here today. I'm honoured that the Chief Minister of the ACT, my friend Andrew Barr, is joining us. Under his leadership, the ACT is delivering one of Australia's most ambitious climate agendas, with a commitment to net zero by 2045. He's also joined by two of my federal colleagues, his predecessor, the former Chief Minister of the ACT, and it's a pleasure and honour to sit around the Shadow Cabinet table with Katie Gallagher, with the experience that she brings to bear in those, in those discussions, and Alicia Payne, who will have an important role to play in Labor governments for many years to come. I also want to acknowledge Pat Conroy in particular. Pat is the Shadow Minister assisting me for climate change, and he was integrally involved in developing the policy we announced last week. He brings a valuable insight as a regional MP representing an area which is at the focal point of the transition in energy underway. Also, as Shadow Minister for International Development in the Pacific, he has developed a first-class understanding of the challenges and opportunities of climate change in our region. He's a valued colleague and friend. For many years, particularly under John Howard, Australia's approach to climate change policy was governed by the principle of no regrets. This was the concept that any potential action should be governed by the principle of not regretting the economic cost of that action. The irony, however, is that that approach has left Australia with plenty to regret. Australia, which has so often prided itself on punching above our weight on big issues, has been weighed down by dysfunctional politics, by the politics of division, resulting in a pathetic lack of ambition for our country and an embarrassing lack of action. While we were told that we would regret the economic cost of action, we've ended up regretting that Australia has missed out on so much economic opportunity. More petajoules of sun hit our landmass each year than any other country. Our wind resource is some of the best in the world as well. We're an energy exporting country, meaning we have the skills and expertise to lead the transformation to renewable energy. Australia, which has for so long searched for areas of comparative advantage, has for the better part of two decades taken a pass on a comparative advantage staring us in the face. We could have by now been well on the way to becoming a renewable energy superpower. Of course, we still can be, but we've left our run so very late and we don't have a day to waste in catching up. Far too many deniers and delayers have run the toxic but effective fear campaign about the economic costs of climate action. And far too many are doing so still today. In a crowded field, the tactics of Scott Morrison at the last election win the prize for being the low point of sophistry and toxicity. Australians were told that action on climate change would come at a cost to the economy of billions of dollars. Instead of being treated to a contest of ideas, a genuine contest of ideas about how to lead the transition to renewable energy, the job opportunities in that transition, the Australian people were subjected to weeks of disinformation about how action would cost their jobs, their community and even their weekend. Now, having sniffed the winds of political change with too many of their own MPs under mortal threat from voters fed up with lies about climate change, Scott Morrison and the LNP want us to believe that they are the party to be trusted with this economic transformation. Seriously. The guy who warned that electric cars would end the weekend, 
The guy who claimed that big batteries are as effective as a big banana or a big prawn, who, denied, who derided renewable energy targets as nuts, these guys, including Josh Frydenberg's energy minister, who attempted to derail and destroy South Australia's world-leading transformation to renewable energy, these guys reckon they are the team to manage this massive economic transformation? And arguably, the even greater, even greater than the economic cost of the LNPs in action has been the cost to our body politic of their toxic and constant identity politics of division. They've spent years dividing Australians and pitting, pitting cities against the regions on the issue of climate change. It's meant to be the job of the national government and particularly the job of the Prime Minister of the day to unite Australians around important national goals and projects. But when Scott Morrison sneers at the climate concerns of people who frequent city wine bars, when he talks derisively of the goat's cheese circle, when Barnaby Joyce dares to speculate, dares to speculate that people who lost their homes in the bushfires were probably Greens voters, they betray that important unifying role. This pandering to identity politics of division makes my blood boil. And now all of a sudden, worried about their urban seats, these characters announce a road to Damascus conversion, declaring that having divided Australians for so long, they are just the right people to unite Australians around this important national task. Ending the destructive politics division on climate is going to be a key task of an Albanese Labor government, just as it fell to Bob Hawke and Labor to bring national reconciliation after the divisions and the tumultuous decades to, le to leading to 1983, so it will fall to us to bring Australians together in dealing with what is the world's biggest challenge and Australia's biggest economic opportunity. Let's be frank, our party has paid a big price in these climate wars. We bear the scars. There are some keen observers who predicted that Labor would simply match the coalition's approach to climate to minimise the risk of yet another destructive scare campaign from a government that has no record and no agenda to campaign on. As if signing up to their weak and pathetic targets and effectively endorsing their politics of division might be an effective tactic to convince people to vote Labor. As far as I'm concerned, this was never going to happen. Because while we must, of course, learn the lessons of battles lost, we must ensure we learn the right lessons. The answer is not to eradicate our ambition, but to craft our policies to ensure we can win the argument that climate action is an essential element of, not a break on, economic growth, investment and jobs. Our policy released last week, Powering Australia, was accompanied by the most substantial modelling ever released by an Australian opposition on any policy ever. We spent this year thinking deeply about how to design our climate policies with maximum economic impact for our country. And this modelling helps us assess and explain just what that impact will be. Several months ago, I outlined four principles that would underpin Labor's climate policies. Each of these principles is put into effect in the policies that Anthony and I announced last Friday. First, that net zero by 2050 is an absolutely essential starting point, but it's not enough. The drive to net zero must be accompanied by strong medium-term targets. Secondly, that those targets must be accompanied by substantial and well-designed policy measures. Aspiration is essential, but it's not enough. Third, that good climate policy is good jobs policy, and that should be reflected in the policy design. And fourth, that the regions which have powered Australia for so long must be at the centre of climate change policy going forward. They must not be an afterthought, but an absolute, absolutely central point of our policy development, and they have been. 